Greetings, brethren, from where, wherever you are. I hope you're having an outstanding feast. On the world scene over the last year, it has been such a difficult economic situation spreading around the planet, spreading confusion and even panic in so many financial circles. Many have begun to wonder, how will this affect me? How will this affect my life, my job? Some have even been in a state of panic in the world, hopefully not in the church. Question is, will I lose my job? What kind of a future do I have for myself and for my family to look forward to? Very much likely many of you have experienced some of the worry and even some of the fear. Some who are getting closer to retirement have wondered about their future as well. And yet we have such a bright vision of the kingdom of God. And still we know that there will be tremendous upheavals in society over the coming years. Some of this chaos and some of this trauma will affect us individually, collectively. And oh yes, we know that God will protect his own children, but we also know that we are part of the society. We are affected by this society in so many ways. And for these eight days at the Feast of Tabernacles, we have the blessing to separate ourselves somewhat from this society. And that is a tremendous blessing to be able to focus on the coming kingdom of God for eight days. And we can rejoice before the great God as we anticipate the future arrival of the kingdom of God in a few short years. And the question I'd like to ask today is, so how do we cope with coming world chaos in our lives? How do we maintain a positive spirit in troubled times? In our own lives, we'll face many questions as the years go by. The title of the sermon is, A Future and a Hope. So today I'd like to look at recent world events, world events that have been transpiring over the last year that potentially can generate unease and even a level of fear even in our lives as we anticipate the effect on our family and ourselves. And then secondly, I'd like to look at ways that we can cope and even mentally, emotionally, spiritually prosper as we look forward to the kingdom of God in the immediate years to come. That time now as we enter the very transition to the kingdom of God. So let's begin by a quick look at the world scene as we've seen it occur over the last year or so. A quote from one of the world's richest men, in fact, at, a t- at certain times he has been the world's richest man, an individual that many people are aware of, his success, Mr. Warren Buffett. He stated the following a while back. In my adult lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen people as fearful economically as they are now. The recession is going to get worse. I don't want to hold out false hopes that by some magic bullet that things will turn around in a couple of months. This really is an economic Pearl Harbor. That sounds melodramatic, but I've never used that phrase before. And this really is one, end of quote. Well, kind of interesting to hear from a very successful individual, Mr. Warren Buffett. Initially, the beginning of the recent crisis started in America. That's very clear and that's very obvious to all and to world leaders, where a booming real estate market was fueled by cheap mortgage money flowing into the country from many different directions. People were offered loans without proof, of income without even down payment money of their own and with interest rates that were adjustable upward and inevitably upward in a matter of time. And the naive assumption was that real estate, the real estate market would continue to grow forever. It would go up and up and up. The trend would continue. It didn't. And of course we know the bubble burst. Who's to blame for this scenario, for this outcome? Well, Investment bankers, investors who lusted after increasing profits, unusual profits, and even potential home buyers who lusted after homes they could not afford, they were not able to pay for. And initially it was assumed it was only an American problem. German finance minister Peter Steinbeck addressed the German parliament 
and stated that the problem was due to, quote, investment bankers and politicians in New York, in Washington, and London, <clears throat> whom he stated were motivated by an Anglo-Saxon drive for excessive gain. Kind of an interesting perspective, isn't it? An Anglo-Saxon drive for excessive gain. We'll call that greed. He went on to say that, quote, the world will never be as it was before the crisis. The United States will lose its superpower status in the world financial system. The financial crisis is, above all, an American problem, end of quote. Well, it certainly has been. It certainly started out as an American problem, but it also rapidly became a European problem and then a global problem as it spread to countries around the globe. Well, the credit crunch itself wrecked havoc in time in Europe. According to CNNMoney.com, quote, additional bank failures threaten to further undermine investor confidence at a time when the global economy is slowing, stocks are plummeting, and sh short-term markets are locked up, end of quote. And according to the Center for European Policy Studies, quote, some of the major European banks have leverage ratios that must, under current market conditions, be a disaster in waiting. Some ominous predictions there. And European stock markets dramatically plunged, including, of course, France, Germany, and Austria. Additional stock markets plunged in Britain, in Iceland, Russia, Japan, Hong Kong, and many, many other nations. And back in the United States, some experts stated that the United States government's actions may not be enough to stop the global economy from plunging into the worst downturn seen in at least 25 years, if not the Great Dep Depression. So, of course, there was virtually universal alarm at the economy, at the future direction of the world, of world trade. And finally, an interesting note, I think this relates to human nature and the core of the problem. According to Netscape News, a while back, a floor trader on a New York stock exchange stated, quote, fear has been running rampant all over the street. Fear and greed, that's what rules Wall Street. I think the carcass has been stripped to the bone, end of quote. And you, uh, you, you get a verbal and also a visual image, the carcass being stripped to the bone of vultures waiting in the wings of greed running rampant. Of course, over the months, things may change. It may get better. Uh, economy may improve, but we know ultimately there will be a continual downturn in the United States and many other countries before the time of the end. At one point in time, the United States stock market had lost 8.3 trillion U.S. dollars, 8.3, to make a more manageable figure to understand. That's equivalent to 27,000 U.S. dollars for every man, woman, and child in the entire country of 305 million people. $27,000 loss per person. That is absolutely staggering never been seen at that level before. Well, the average citizen doesn't own a lot of stock. Not Most of us in the church don't own a lot of stock, but this type of economic fear affects everybody. It impacts all of us to one degree or another. They have been concerned, so many people, about their jobs, about their small retirement investments, about their future about their future, even potential retirement, and their family. And of course, as we've heard, as we've often heard, a recession is when others lose their job. A depression is when you lose your job. And we know it does impact a person that way. When it impacts a person personally, their own family, it has a different psychological impact. A psychological therapist recently stated in our particular area of the country, uh, Sacramento, California, quote, there's real anxiety about how people are going to cope and what they're going to do 
It's the first time in my lifetime that there's been this across-the-board financial panic and financial scare. This is the worst I've ever seen it, end of quote. Pretty ominous for people's lives, for their stability, their sense of peace, this kind of fear pervading society in many areas. And though God's people are not the wealthy of the world, national and global e- economies certainly do affect us, don't they? They, in fact, they affect our income, potentially our future, our stability. Now, we know that this particular global crisis is likely not the crisis at the end of the age. It could be, but we don't know. We may have, of course, a few more years yet. And we'll probably muddle through this to one degree or another, as economies have done for many years. But the truth of the matter is, we had better be prepared to weather the storm in the remaining few years, which will eventually lead to the great tribulation and the day of the Lord. We have to be prepared mentally, spiritually, physically, in every way. I think perhaps one of the best analogies for us to remember as we look forward to the kingdom of God and our future is that of normal human childbirth, which parallels our birth into the family of God. For nine long months, there is great anticipation as husband and wife and maybe other children look forward to the birth of that next child. And as the time draws near, there's a lot of preparation. Much goes on in a household with a couple, uh, new baby clothes may be washed and gotten ready for the new arrival. Plans for the hospital trip or the birthing clinic are made. Typically, a bag is packed and ready. Everything's ready at home. And it's an exciting time to anticipate that birth as father and mother as they wait for the little newborn bundle of love. And then comes the early preparatory contractions that occur during that last month, during that last few weeks. These are not the full-blown birth contractions that will occur later. They are the preparatory contractions that get the mother ready, to get her body ready and maybe her mind ready, psychologically and physically and physiologically. This signals the time of delivery uh, of the birth. It's nearing. It's an exciting time looking forward, of course, to uh, a little new bundle, a tiny baby in the expanding family. It's also a time of some trepidation as the mother and potentially the father realizes that she will soon be going through the more difficult stages of contraction. I can remember uh, my wife saying in the past and admitting that at one point in time she remembers thinking in her mind that, I don't want to do this. And, of course, that passes. You know, it's in gear. There's no turning back. You must face the future and accomplish that which we're called to accomplish. Well, brethren, we're in the very early stages of this birth process in our lives spiritually. We have been begotten by the great God. We've been given God's spirit. We've been called to mature, to grow. Hopefully, we have grown spiritually. Hopefully, we intend to grow spiritually in the years ahead. But we're not yet born into the family of God. This life is the gestation for real life yet to come, birth into the family of God. And currently we may experience some very preparatory contractions, very early contractions. And the real labor pains have not yet started, but we definitely are getting closer month by month and year by year. And to be born, there will will be labor pains And it goes with the territory, but this is the only route to birth, to our birth into the eternal family of God. So we experience a mixture of trepidation and fear as to what is ahead of us as we look forward to the years beyond, as we look forward even towards the coming kingdom of God, a time of great joy, but we must experience that birth process. And we can also, though, experience an overwhelming confidence and joy in the outcome of that birth process, something that should excite us, should enliven us, should encourage us, no matter what transpires in the months and years ahead of us. So in the remaining time 
of the sermon. Let's look more closely at ways that we can cope with anxiety and fear, even mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, prosper during that time in the immediate years ahead of us as we face the end of the age through the very transition of the birthing contractions leading to the kingdom of God. We know Scripture tells us in 1 John 4, 18, that with perfect love there is no fear. And, of course, that is true. We have to understand, though, we, have, we must develop the very mind, the very love of the great God, and slowly but surely we can lose our fears and our anxieties as we face the future, asking God to instill more of that perfect outgoing concern for others, but also for the great God. He knows what he's doing. He's on track. He's there for his family. He is the perfect father, the perfect parent, and we can trust him. In perfect love, there is no fear. It casts out fear. So let's go over a few of the key points as we look forward to that transition to our birth in the kingdom of God. Let's look forward to approximately four points that can help reassure us, prepare us for that time as we face some difficult years before, of course, birth into the family of God. Number one, when we face fears in the years ahead, whether it's with our own finances or our health, and many will face difficulties with their health, or even our safety from time to time, it's time to, number one, fully seek and take refuge in our God. Refuge in our God. And sometimes when we face a new fear, that's just come to light. We've just become aware of a new fear. We forget at times to do the obvious, which should be the obvious, but we're so tense or excited by the threat that we forget. And we can get so busy with our focus on the immediate, maybe asking the question, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? How can I cope? Maybe even at times, why me? You know, why, why does this have to happen to me? And we don't immediately approach our God to focus on the great God and what he's capable of. We might say that the perceived reality of what may or may not come to pass, unfortunately, is more real to us at that moment than God and his intervention itself. So immediately when a fear sneaks up on us, it's time to seek to really seek God. It's time to move closer to our God, to our rock, to our fortress. I think of Isaiah 58, at times of difficulty, at times of fear, where we turn to God more fully and we seek the great God. We run up the red flag, so to speak, in a genuine way, and we may spend time fasting. Hopefully that's one of the first things we think of as we face a difficulty, a fear, a major decision, a trial, we fully seek and tr take refuge in our God. Isaiah 58, of course, one of the fasting chapters. We turn to God fully, wholeheartedly. And when we do, if we do it in, in the right way, the, f the first five chapters tell us how not to, so I won't go there today. But in verse 6, it begins how to fast, how to seek our God at difficult times, Hopefully not just in difficult times, but difficult times will come. Verse 6, is this not the fast that I have chosen? So if we're going to fast, we might as well do it God's way. We might as well make it count. It goes on to say to loose the bonds of wickedness. In other words, our personal sins in life, our hang-ups, the troubles that we have that we know we've not overcome, to undo the heavy burdens sometimes the burdens of sin that we have placed on ourselves for various reasons. We carry that burden for too long. To let the oppressed go free, and oftentimes we oppress ourselves with our imperfections, with our past, with our hang-ups, and that you break every yoke, spiritual slavery, where we can be yoked to our past, to sins, to habits, and we are to break every yoke. 
Is it not, verse 7, to share your bread with the hungry? In other words, as we begin to fast, we're, we're reminded of God's outgoing way of life in every facet, hopefully, of our life. And that you bring into your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and hide not yourself from your own flesh. Sometimes when trouble comes collectively as a church, we're going to have to take care of each other. We have that outgoing concern. That's the mind that God wants to see. Verse 8, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Uh, your light, your clarity, and God's going to lead us and guide us. And your healing shall spring forth speedily and sometimes physically, but sometimes, of course, more importantly, your, your health spiritually. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, in every way shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you, will be known by right living, by the way of life. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. In other words, God in his might, in his power, will, will be protecting us and watching over us. Verse 9, then you shall call if we seek God at a time of trouble or any other time. In that way, wholeheartedly, you shall call and the Lord will answer. God guarantees for his people who seek him aggressively in this way that he will answer. And you shall cry. In other words, we cry out wholeheartedly. And he will say, here I am. In other words, he's not hard to find, but it's up to us. If you take away the yoke from your midst, in other words, we clean up our life. And the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, you know, even wickedness towards the great God, fear and doubting of God's ability and of his interventions. Verse 10, if you extend your soul to the hungry, that outgoing way of life, again, at times we're going to have to take care of each other and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, your understanding, your clarity shall dawn in your darkest hour. And your darkness shall be as noonday, your downtimes shall be as noonday for others. And we'll have that clarity of thought and confidence in the great God. And the Lord will guide you continually. God offers the guidance through difficult decisions through the years ahead. Satisfy your soul in drought. Maybe financially we're, we're short. Maybe we're even facing financial drought or, or drought related to material needs. God will satisfy our lives and strengthen your bones, and you shall be like a watered garden. And like a spring of water whose waters do not fail, it goes on to say, and those from among you shall build the old waste places, leading, that is, into the millennium, into the kingdom of God. And we'll have the privilege of building the old waste places on this planet. And you shall raise up the foundations of many generations for a thousand years. And you shall be called the repair of the breach, of the breach between God and man, between man and God, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Well, it's just a reminder that when we have difficult decisions, difficult traumas, when we know we're not close enough to God, that we need to fully seek and take refuge in our God. We know King David had an abundance of fears in his life and challenges. His own father-in-law tried to hunt him down and kill him. Even his own son, Absalom, tried to overthrow him. And at times he was surrounded by enemies on every side. And David learned quickly, and he was a man after God's heart. He was wholehearted to seek God in the face of fear as we must learn to do. Psalm chapter 27. And we can take courage at difficult times through the example of King David, who had some very scary situations in his life, as we can have and may have, and yet we can seek our God in the face of fear. Psalm 27 and verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Yes, eternal life, but also physical salvation through trouble and trauma and tribulation. God saves us. 
Whom shall I fear? The world? Or do we fear the great God? The Lord is the strength of my life. And will we keep that in mind at difficult times? Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. And in the end, that will be true of the enemies of truth and of the church and of our enemies. Verse 3, Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, and we will see war, fear, even World War III, in this I will be confident. So we can have that confidence. We don't have to fear. Verse 5, For in the time of trouble, and that time is coming, he shall hide me in his pavilion. He will hide us in his own place, in the secret place of his tabernacle, where he puts his faithful church and his people and he shall hide me and he shall set me high upon a rock a rock solid in confidence god will preserve us and protect us and we know this absolutely applied to david in his time of trouble but it's not just limited to david himself it applies to our time of trouble now or ahead of us no matter how big no matter how small the same principles apply to the firstborn, to those whom God is teaching and training. And we know in this verse, David reminds us we have a place to go when we're fearful. We can take refuge in our God. I know years ago, many of you have experienced some of this, when our children were very small, all four children, when we lived in, in a more rural location in northern Arkansas that was pl prone to windstorms and lightning and rain and even tornadoes and thunder. And when a violent thunderstorm would come rolling in late at night, which it did from time to time, could be almost any month of the year, often you know, after a certain amount of noise and thunder and lightning, and often all four of our young children would come uh, working their way into our, our bedroom, joining my wife and I in bed, and even though they were very small, you know, they recognized that we were their protection. And in their minds, we were their protection. Of course, sometimes the bed got a little bit crowded and difficult thunderstorms. Maybe, maybe the last one in had to sleep at the foot of the bed. But in the same sense, when our emotional thunder brings fear in our life, as it does and will do from time to time, the first thing we should think of is taking refuge in our God. Psalm 32. Psalm 32. There's so much encouragement here from David himself who faced a lot of fear and trouble. In verse 6, 32 verse 6. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. And hopefully we remember that. In a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters whether that's physical waters or armies, and they shall not come near him. There is that promise of protection. Verse 7, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. And we can have that confidence. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. So we can have that, that uplifted mindset, even with songs of deliverance, of an awareness of the great God and his love for his people. God will deliver us as we trust him, as we look to him. And David continually sought God for solutions from all his fears, and he was delivered. And we are no different if we seek our God. Psalm 34, over a couple more chapters. In verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he heard me. And we can have that assurance as well. And delivered me from all my fears. You know, what a, what a blessing it is to be delivered in that way. Verse 6, the poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. That's exciting to think about that God will save us. We can, we can take refuge in our God 
In verse 7, And the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him. Think about that. The angel of the Lord. When we're in a time of trouble, we can remember that the angel of God or the angels of God camp around us. Second Kings, I think, shows an interesting example. I think it's a very visual example. And in truth, it's very helpful to remember that we can visualize even God and his unseen armies that surround us. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 8. Maybe we can retain this mental image of the invisible God, at least to us at this moment, and his army. 2 Kings 6 and verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making a war against Israel, and he took counsel with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And a man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. So he was warning the king. And the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned him that he was watchful there, and he was, not just once or twice. So he was very alert. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me where, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, you know, who is secretly providing the king of Israel with information? And one of his servants, verse 12, one of his servants said, None, my Lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So, so he's saying, Elisha, the servant of God, it knows virtually what you think and what you say even in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is. Go find him, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dotham. And therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out there, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And a servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? The city is surrounded by a great army, potentially tremendously alarming and, and generating fear. Verse 16, so he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Of course, it wasn't yet evident, but it shortly was. And Elisha prayed, verse 17, and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Open his eyes that he may see the wonders of the great God and his army. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Incredible, you know, visual imagery. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. You know, incredible imagery of God's unseen at times protection in our life. We know he's there. We know his servants are there. The angels are there who serve us as well and protect us. So when we are in a time of trouble, and we can remember, we can remember these examples. We can remember the fact that in Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. That's something we can remember. That applies to us. That applies to every one of us who have God's spirit, who trusts the great God. Well, some might say, well, that was the king of Israel. That was Bible times. Well, you know, brethren, these are Bible times today. And God is working with his potential firstborn sons who will be literal kings of, of God in God's kingdom. We know the majority of prophecy applies to our time now. We are living in Bible times. Well, let's move on to the second thought. Number two, as we face the future and the difficulties and the traumas on the road to the kingdom of God, number two, 
We must walk by faith and not by sight. Of course, you've heard that before, but it needs to be real in our life. We walk by confidence in the great God, not by simply by sight. As we see traumas happen around us, and we know following the collapse of the World Trade Center in New York City, September 11, 2001, so many of us had seen the collapse even rerun after rerun. It generated fear and concern across the country and maybe across the globe. And you know, shortly thereafter, as we know, church attendance in the churches of the world dramatically increased. Millions had witnessed the death of almost 3,000 people, and it generated a great deal of fear and anxiety. You know, that could be your city or their city. And so many began to feel the need to connect with God, even in the churches out there of various stripes, to connect with God, some, someone bigger than they are. But, you know, one year later, one year later, 12 months later, surveys indicated that church attendance had dropped down to where it was before the level of the attack. Twelve months later, things were back to normal. In one sense, you might say that the average person walks by sight rather than by faith and confidence in the great God. And that sight of massive destruction motivated people temporarily. They had that in their mind's eye. And they were motivated to try to find God, a protector. But one year later, human nature is, has such a short memory of events. One year later, the sight and memory of the collapse of the tw Twin Towers had dimmed. It had diminished. And people were going about their lives as before. God's people, though, were to be different. We're led by God's Spirit. We potentially have Jesus Christ living in us to the extent we allow him to live in us. And we should walk by faith, confidence, rock-solid confidence in the great God rather than by sight, by what's happening right at the moment around us or in our bank account or even our health for that matter. We walk by faith, hopefully, in the great God. Kind of reminds us, of Matthew chapter 14, Peter's experience. And it's a good example of walking by faith and walking by sight. And we found initial courage and excitement in Peter, saw Christ walking on the water. And then he saw the waves. He saw what was happening around, like so many can today. And, of course, the danger almost overwhelmed him. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24 so the sight at the moment almost overwhelmed his faith. We must not allow that to happen. Matthew 14, verse 24. In a boisterous time, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary to their path, that is. Verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea, walking on water, you know, a, a, a tremendous illustration of the power of the great God, even in spite of the fact that the sea was boisterous. So God didn't necessarily calm it immediately, but Jesus came walking. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. You know, it, it's an apparition. It's something we don't know. And they cried out for fear. So they were overcome with fear kind of natural human nature verse 27 but immediately jesus spoke to them saying be of good cheer it is i do not be afraid trust me and peter answered verse 28 and said lord if it is you command me to come to you on the water command me and i'll have confidence and so he said come and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So he started out looking, keeping his eyes on Jesus Christ. But when he saw, as he began to take his eyes, of course, off of the Savior, and he began to look around, as we can do sometimes in society, the economy, difficulty. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, 
Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And of course, God, I'm sure, will wonder that of us at times if we fear, if we do not trust the great God. So hopefully we want to and are willing to walk by faith, by confidence in the unseen God in his future, in the coming kingdom of God, as opposed to by sight, the difficulties in society, maybe even in the business we're involved in, in our area of the world. We trust the great God totally, and hopefully we walk by faith rather than sight. Well, Scripture tells us as much that we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That's our goal. That's what we're called to, to walk by confidence in the great God. One profound aspect of living faith is the sheer knowledge that what God has promised or revealed through his word will come to pass. We can have rock-solid confidence in the word of God. It will come to pass. You and I know the future. We have the book of Revelation. We have so many prophecies, all the prophets. And we know about the tribulation. We know about the day of the Lord. We know about economic collapse and trauma and World War III. My point is, can't we live our lives with the sure knowledge of what is to come to pass and our need to stay close to God? Can't we keep that in our mind? Can't we walk by faith right now? Not just maybe when we face great fear, but right now in our preparatory transition phase to the kingdom of God. Or do we need the evidence literally of seeing bombs falling in our cities before getting ourselves spiritually in gear, trusting the great God? Do we really need to walk by sight before really believing the great God? No. Walking by faith, seeking God aggressively today, not just later, but today, rather than waiting to be motivated by sight, by trauma, by difficulty, by danger, you know, is a better way, is a more sure way, is a more peaceful way to seek the great God. Things are happening in our society, and they will continue to. Matthew chapter 25, we have a clear indication that we can't wait till we're in danger to seek God aggressively. Matthew 25 Verses 1 through 13. Interesting parable, of, of course. And we need to be preparing. We need to be preparing for trauma, for tribulation, to trust the great God today rather than waiting till we see danger tomorrow. Matthew 25, verse 1. And the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. And obviously, the lesson is we want to be wise. We want to be preparing. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. You know, they took no oil. They weren't prepared, having keeping, kept their mind on the things of God, praying and studying and occasionally fasting. You know, they weren't there. They were just more focused on career and the things of the world. Verse 4, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They were preparing. They were, they were trying to move closer to God ahead of time. In analogy, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. That can happen to us. We think, well, the Lord delays his coming. Maybe it's not very soon. Maybe it's way down the road. Verse 6, and at midnight a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So it's time to get ready. Of course, the alert went out. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. you know, we can't ride in on the coattails of anyone else who is very close to God, who've been praying and setting and developing the very mind of God. They've, decision-making ability to think like God, though not perfectly. We can't ride the coattails of anyone else. 
No less there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. There is a point in time where the door is shut, and that will be true in the years ahead of us. And afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. You know, that's uh, kind of a reminder. And we read in Revelation 3 of a Laodicean mindset where people are, are knowledgeable but lukewarm. They're not spiritually on fire. They have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And Christ says, in effect, they are neither hot nor cold, and he will spew them out of his mouth, that is, out into the world, not in, in God's protection. Verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither, speaking to us, we don't know the day or the hour, we don't know precisely in which the Son of Man is coming. And we're told then to be ready. We need to be empowered by God's Spirit today, not wait till tomorrow. That is, if we're walking by faith rather than by sight. Luke chapter 21, a reminder, Luke chapter 21. Hopefully, we want to be worthy. We want to be ready. We know difficult times are coming. And we take God's word as warning for our own benefit, for our own blessing. Luke chapter 21, verse 33. Christ said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness. Hopefully not in the church, but, but with the cares of this life, your career, your future, your empire, the cares of this life, in that day come on you unexpectedly. You're not alert, you're not aware, you're not ready, you don't have enough oil in your lamp. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore, Christ said, parallel here, and pray always. In other words, be in that mindset seeking the great God, walking by faith rather than by sight. That you may be counted worthy because of your closeness with the great God to escape all those things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So we want to stand before the Son of Man, ready, prepared, you might say, in our change or the resurrection, ready to hit the ground running at the very beginning of the millennium. Incredible. Incredible blessings, protection. God offers us that assurance. If we're close to God, if we're very close to God, we will be worthy to escape worthy to escape all the things that are coming to pass. That is, if we're walking by faith, if we're walking in confidence in the great God rather than by sight. You know, in other words, what's happening right now in our life, our bank account, our health, our situation, we get our minds on ourselves fully instead of on the great God and his plan. Well, that was point number two. We must walk by faith and not by sight if we're going to successfully go through that transition as we face the birth, our birth into the kingdom of God. Number three, number three, God will fight our battles. We have to have that confidence. God will fight our battles if we are very close to him, if we allow him to. If we want him to, if we allow him to, we really don't have anything to fear. According to the Word of God, according to his mindset, the way he thinks for his children. Let's look at a courageous example. And I enjoy this example, especially when Judah, under King Jehoshaphat, clearly walked for a period of time by faith, and God rewarded them greatly at that moment in time. Second Chronicles. Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter twenty and verse one. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 1. And it happened after this that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon and others 
with them besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria. So big trouble on the horizon. What do you do? Do you freak out and panic to use a, the vernacular? Or do you seek your God? Well, let's see what uh, happened here. Quite impressive. Lesson for us. Verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared. He feared. Of course, he ultimately feared the great God. He trusted God and set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. And so Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah... They came to seek the Lord. Pretty impressive as a people. They sought God and his deliverance. Verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers. And I like this section here as as he speaks boldly to the great God, full of faith, not, not arrogantly, but boldly to the great God. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? You know, speaking to God in that way at times, we we approach God, we honor him, we reason with him in this fashion. Verse 7. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Very bold, not arrogant, but bold, in full confidence, seeking God. Verse 8, And they they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, Verse 9, If disaster comes upon us, such as the sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. A tremendously reassuring, reminding God, it of course was for his good, but reminding God in the process, and what a blessing it is. Having that kind of courageous mind, seeking God. Verse 10, and now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. And here they are, verse 11, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. What courage. Uh, What a courageous example of leadership. Verse 12, notice. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. In other words, we are walking by spiritual faith. Our, Our spiritual eyesight is upon you, great God. Verse 13. Let's move on to verse 15. And he said, that is the servants of God, listen all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is yours, is not yours, but God's. And of course we know that's our life as well. If we're trusting God, if we're seeking our God, Verse 17, and you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, don't be fearful, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And of course, that applies to us as well, that applies to us individually and collectively it applies to us we have that kind of leadership we have of 
course, our evangelists at headquarters, Mr. Merritt, Mr. Ames, Dr. Renell. We have that kind of leadership, and we must have that kind of courage individually and c collectively. Brethren, is that our mindset? Are we willing to fully trust our God and allow him to fight our battles in this journey ahead? Are we willing to trust our God? Let's look at a specific future example, Revelation 12. Revelation chapter 12, looking forward to the future, times of difficulty, hopefully times of courage, times of God's intervention, Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea and to all the planet at that time time for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time verse 13 and as we look at the transition from ancient israel to the to the church today now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child of course physical israel and then we see the transition to spiritual israel but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. You know, three and a half years prophetically nourished, protected by the great God. Verse 15, so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood, whether it's actual water or armies. God is more powerful than anything the serpent or Satan can throw at God's people. Verse 16, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Very clearly, if we're walking by faith, not by sight. If we trust the great God, even at times like this, you know, we can see that God can and will intervene, similar to the experience of Moses and children of Israel, and later Jehoshaphat. God fights the battles of those who walk by faith. Verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the remnant, those who remained, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is, they have the truth, but they're walking by sight. They seek God only when the pressure is on. And that's a warning to us. We must be alert and aware, trusting the great God. So that assurance is there for us, that God is continually there for us. Satan can't reach us if we're in contact with the great God, if we walk by faith, no power in the universe is strong enough to separate us from God, not even Satan and his demons. You know, God will intervene powerfully for us. Psalm 91, a quick reference to Psalm 91 at that time, potentially at the end of the age when Satan goes to make war even with those who are Philadelphian in spirit. We can trust our God if we walk by faith, not by sight, even when the chips are down. Psalm 91, verse 1, maybe specifically for that time, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, that is, who trusts the great God, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust our protector, our defender. We can trust the great God. Verse 3, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, from all kinds of traps that are out there that Satan has, even, even pestilence, even more deadly forms of uh, swine flu or whatever comes our way. God has the capacity to protect his people. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers, symbolically, and under his wings you shall take refuge. You can trust God. He will protect you. And his truth shall be your shield 
and your buckler, even the knowledge of the truth of the soon coming kingdom of God can sustain us at that time. And you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. You know, nighttime terror is always a little greater in the darkness. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the, the destruction that lays waste at noonday, warfare. A thousand may fall at your side. We may see that as God leads us out of society, maybe through various metropolitan areas. And 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eye shall you look. If you're walking by faith, you'll be able to see by sight and see the reward of the wicked. The reward of the wicked, very clear that God will protect us as we walk through that time, trusting the great God. God will deliver us. Let's move on to one final point. And let's remember, point number four, remember God's promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. We are his children. Hebrews 13, 5. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. God will provide our needs. We don't have to build our empire. It's not going to last for himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If God's with me, if I'm with God, what can man do to me? In incredible courage. So we need to remember that we're not traveling this path alone. Our God is with us every step of the way. As we look forward to the kingdom of God, as we look forward to that transition to our birth, even at difficult time, we aren't traveling this path alone. God is with us. I think we can all probably remember many times those who have had children, and I can uh, as well, my wife and I, when we would have little toddlers walking with one of our children, hanging on to maybe their hand, maybe our right hand in their hand. And every once in a while, a little toddler will kind of stumble, and a parent will typically pick them up, lift them up so their knees don't totally buckle. And, of course, our God is that way with us. And we, God will hold us up. We can regain our footing if we trust God. And we won't skin our knee. It's like a, a little toddler that a parent is, is hanging on to. And as we stay close to God, no matter how difficult the going gets, God will do the same for us. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, King David, continually staying close to God, realized that God would lift him up. Psalm 139, God would not abandon him. And we have that same promise. Verse 139, verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Can, can you hide from God? And the answer is no. You don't want to if you're close to God, if you're looking to God for protection. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there, into the atmosphere. If I make my bed in, in hell, in the grave, or in, behold, you are there. If I take the, wing, the wings of the morning and dwell in the innermost parts of the sea, maybe we fly off to some, some island in the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God says he will sustain us and hold us in the same way. King David had a unique confidence in God's ability to sustain him in times of trouble. And we need that same kind of confidence. God offers us that same kind of assurance. Look at God's comforting words to physical Israel. But you know, they even apply more to us as spiritual Israel. Isaiah 41 in verse 10, we're reminded to fear not, Isaiah 41. And God has said this to his servants so many times in so many ways. Isaiah 41, verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, don't panic, for I am your God. I am your creator. I am your father. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
Well, in the remaining years, as the pace of world events began to speed up, we will see an utterly unique time in all of human history. Yes, Christ referred to our path there as firstborn children of God as narrow, as difficult, but we have every reason to succeed, every reason to have confidence. We're told in 1 John 4, 4, You are of God. He, that is Christ, who is in you, is greater than he, literally Satan, who is in the world. And we have Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, within us, leading us just as he led ancient Israel and Jehoshaphat and Moses and all the rest. Jesus Christ, the very creator of the universe, will live his life in us through the remaining years. He can literally overpower or empower us to overcome the world, overcome the difficulties in our situation. The one who will hold our right hand will also defend us with the power of his might. Truly, brethren, we have a future and we have a hope. And when the contractions of our birth process come on stronger, and they will, let's remember God's words of comfort and encouragement in Jeremiah chapter 30, chapter 29. God wants us to succeed. He, he has a future and a hope in mind. Jeremiah 30, 29, verse 11. Comforting words. I think one of potentially our, could be our favorite scriptures as we face the future, difficult times. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. In other words, not of evil that will come out of society either. To give you a future and a hope. Verse 12, and then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Well, brethren, our God offers us a real future and a hope. We can have confidence in the great God, rock-solid confidence. Let us seek him with our whole heart. And just like a loving father, he will see us through.